<laughs> Does the sign work? No. Well, good morning to you all. We're glad to have you here today. We'll uh, begin with the call of, to worship. We have great joy in Christ our Lord, who calls and heals us. For a while we grieve our sufferings. We are reminded that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Come, let us hope in the Lord. Next we have the, uh, gosh, we have the announcements. There used to be a thing up there, didn't it? I don't know what the announcements are. Oh, wait a minute. I found it. All right. So on Monday the 23rd at 6.30, there's, they will have a men's group meeting and a quilt guide. Ooh, so the men are going to teach you how to do a quilt. Come. Uh, Tuesday at 9 a.m., the uh, bazaar crafting at the church continues. They're going to have many things to offer uh, and can use your help if you have time. Wednesday at 6.30, we have prayer time and also at 7 o'clock, the followed at 7 o'clock on the 25th is the women's Bible study. Saturday the 28th is Halloween in the park. Tuesday the 31st is Tunk, Trunk and Treat. And then Friday, of course, is the annual bazaar. Anything to add or correct? Whoops. So we have an encouragement to come out for the trunk and treats. You can eat whatever is left over so you can give or receive, you know. So it's good. And uh, there's also got an excellent chef that creates uh, hot dogs, too. And so, uh, Carol. So we'll have uh, need, it sounds like, for additional uh, pastries and uh, cooking like that and that you can stop by and get the um, containers that, to, that will be used and ask what it is that perhaps you can do and add if you have time. We've got good cooks, so, you know, let your, let your light shine, so to speak. <coughs> Any other additions or corrections? Did Erie win substate? I forgot to see. We were runner up at the substate. Those girls uh, absolutely played the best volleyball of the season. They beat a team that they had been unable to beat in order to get into the finals. And uh, they took home in the three games and just basically ran out of gas at the end of the game. They really gave it to their entire parts of So here he did come second in uh, sub-state, and it's, it's a great and a fun time, I think, always to see the youth. We always like to see our youth do better, of course, but it's great to see that enthusiasm and, and those that can uh, do and work together with a team. Okay, any, all righty, so there's no more messages and additions, and so we'll begin our song, so.
If it's convenient for you, would you please go ahead and stand? <clears throat> I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, the free of Jesus that's okay. I do. I think that's okay. I think it's okay to enjoy worshiping because, you know, if you don't enjoy it, um, heaven is going to be all about worship. You know, that's the one commandment we have that we know about heaven, and that is an eternity of being able to worship God. And so as we sing... And then, and then the, probably the best thing about what I read in the scripture is that uh, 
God commands us to sing and make melody in our hearts. The one thing he doesn't say is sing and sound really, really good. And I'm thankful for that. Amen? All right. All right. Because it's all about just singing from your heart. And uh, so that's what we're going to do today. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so high. Glorious in heaven above Humbly you came to the earth you created All for love's sake became poor oh, Here I am to worship together worthy all together wonderful to me I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross I'll never know how much it costs upon that cross oh, here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me. Indeed, Father, you are altogether wonderful and lovely and worthy. You're the God that is worthy of our worship, a God that deserves our worship. And Father, we know that we're not the people who deserve you, but you loved us anyway. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Father, we thank you we can come today and help our focus to be up on you. Lord, may the things of the world, the things that uh, we worry about, the things that we're concerned about, may we be able to put them aside for the next few minutes and just hear you speak to us. To know that you love us and you care for us. And you've got something better for us. May our hope be focused in Jesus. May he be the reason for our life and living each day. And now we pray as your son taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And lead us not as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated and our children may go to Children's Church. A new employee at the florist took a telephone order from a customer. The lady on the phone said the ribbon must be white with gold letters reading rest in peace on both sides and if you can squeeze it in we shall meet in heaven. When the floral tribute reached the home of the deceased the inscription read rest in peace on both sides and if you can squeeze it in we'll meet in heaven. That is our purpose to meet in heaven, right? It's interesting study to go through the Bible and examine the names for God. The Hebrew mind, similar to that of the Native American way of thinking, was that names have meaning and significance and importance. We looked at the book of Ruth a few weeks ago, and you remember Ruth come back to Bethlehem, and they said, oh, is it, not, and Naomi, and they said, oh, could this be Naomi? You remember what she said? Don't call me Naomi. Why? Naomi means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter, because the Almighty has made my life bitter. Abraham means the father of many nations. Isaac, <laughs> laugh. Jacob, how would you like to have this tag? Deceiver. Reuben, he has seen my mi misery. Simeon, the one who hears. In the Hebrew, when you have a name that ends in E-L, which many do, you have to understand that name has something to do with God. Because the Hebrew word for God is L, E-L. So you have something like Bethel, house of God. Daniel, God is my judge. There's several names in the Bible for God. Uh, the one most often is Elohim. We call this the plural of majesty. El would be the singular, Elohim would be plural. But uh, when it refers to God, largely it uses the term Elohim. But keep in mind, if it's talking about a king, it also uses the plural. I, I, we would call that the plural of majesty. El, uh, Elion, God most high. El Shaddai, God almighty or the sufficient one. Elohim to Shabbat, Lord of hosts. Adonai is simply the word for Lord. And you may have uh, looked in your Bibles at times. You may have seen where Lord is capital all the way across. Or the lar uh, L is large and the next three letters are smaller but they're still capitals. And if you look, uh, particularly in your translation, look at the very front, you may find that that is where, where they're putting Adonai, or Lord, in for the name of God. Because in the Old Testament, uh, it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So when they came to that name of God in Scripture, they didn't pronounce it, they didn't read it, they substituted the word Adonai, or Lord. Now, interesting, the Hebrew... Well, Hebrew itself did not have vowels until the 10th century A.D. because, well, if you read it, you read the context, you know what it says, and you don't need them. Uh, you get used to that, but uh, when you're away from it and it's a new a foreign language, you need those. And so they put little dots and dashes underneath the consonants to be the vowels. And uh, I heard about one guy in a Hebrew test. He put a bunch of them at the bottom of the page and said, if I missed any, just take some of these and use them. But, uh, uh, so when they came to the name of God, since it's never pronounced, they had no idea what vowels to go in there. And so they put the vowels for Adonai, Lord. And that's where we came up with the word Jehovah. And uh, scholars today would say, probably more accurately, it would be Yahweh. Yahweh or Jehovah, which means the self-existent one. The God who was, is, and always will be. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Jehovah N Nisi, the Lord is my banner. And then there's names like given to God as Redeemer, Savior, Father, Deliverer, Shield, Righteous One. But probably the most famous is that which was given to Moses as he was standing before the burning bush. And he says, when I go back to people and they ask me who sent me, what shall I tell them? And he says, just tell them I am 
sent you. I am the eternal one, the one who was, is, and always will be. Now, this may not be real significant to you, but um, in fact, I saw the other day an advertisement for a book that says uh, something about praying the names of God. 52 names of, there'd be names of God, terms of his character, and how to pray that. And, uh, you know, if you're asking for healing, you might use the name Jehovah Rapha. Um, I, I think that sometimes we forget about the importance of praise in our prayers. I, I would challenge you to take a, and we're going to talk about a few of them, not very many today, of characteristics of God, of his nature, and, and pray. Them. For example, God is eternal. Well, God, I, I'm grateful that you're eternal, but that means you always was, and you always will be, and you always are. Uh, I, you're, I'm not going to outlive you. You're going to be there forever. You've seen the beginning to the end. I, I know that you're there for me. Or uh, certainly you would know how to pray that God is love. I mean, be grateful for that because he loved us and gave himself for us. But names tell us something of God's nature and his character, of who he is and what he's done and what he is doing for us. Now our praise is based on God's nature and his character. And the more we know about God, the more we want to praise him. Now a vital component of worship is praise. And as you read the book of Revelation, you understand that God is not only worthy of our worship and our praise, heaven is going to be filled with worship and praise. And like Jamie said, if you don't like praising, you may not be comfortable in heaven. Because that's what we're going to be doing up there. We're going to worship him throughout eternity. Now, Revelation makes it one thing perfectly clear, and that is only God is worthy of our worship. To worship anything else is idolatry. Twice in the book of Revelation, John falls down before the angel to worship, and twice he's told not to. The last one is in 22. Chapter 22 says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when, I heard and, uh, when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant to you with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. Worship God. God is deserving of our worship because of his nature, of who he is. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the fact that God is sovereign, that God is in control of history. And one reason that we worship God is because he's active in the affairs of mankind. He is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is the Almighty who reigns. Then came a voice from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of a rushing winds with a loud peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Now under that same vein, we can say that God is all-powerful. Now if you want a big word for that, it's omnipotent, okay? Uh, the word that's often used in Scripture is simply almighty. In other words, there's nothing he cannot do. Now, I know at this point, some joker's going to say, well, well can, God, can God make a square circle? Or can God make a mountain so big he can't lift it? Now, the problem with that is not the problem with the power of God. The problem with that is your logic, okay? That's the same logic as ask the question, what happens when irresistible force hits an immovable object? Well, I can tell you one or two things are going to happen. Either irresistible force is going to stop or the movable object is going to move. You're not going to have two of those impossibilities going on at the same time. God is not limited by his power and his strength, but God is limited by his nature. Let me explain. The scripture says that God cannot lie. God is truth. So God is limited by his nature. He will always tell the truth. He cannot lie. He cannot go against his nature. Last week we looked at the fact that God is love. He loves all people, and that includes you and me. And that alone is reason to worship him. He loves us, he cares for us, his son died for us. So we know that God is sovereign, we know that God is love. But thirdly, we look at the nature of God, we see that he is eternal. 
He's from eternity to eternity. He always has been. He always will. He's without beginning and without end. And personally, I cannot comprehend that with my finite mind. And so you have a child who asks you that simple question, you know, where did God come from? Or how can he be eternal? I don't know. Probably the best explanation I can give is to look at a ring. And I can't take mine off. I guess I'll be buried with it. I've been banded like a wild bird. At one point, my wife decided it was getting too smooth and not fancy enough. So she bought me another one. Says, I said, no. I said, not unless I get a new wife. I'll keep the old ring and the old wife, which I've done. I can't get off, but a ring, it has no beginning and no end. It's a continuous circle. So it is with God. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who was and is, or who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. The four, 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. The seventh angel sounded a trumpet and there was loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. God is eternal. Probably the great I am is the eternal present one. He always was, always is, and always will be. In other words, he is always there for you. You can always count on him. Another aspect of God is the fact that he's holy. He's righteous. As we look at God, I think that's one thing that's evident. As John catches a glimpse of heaven, he's taken before the throne and he sees God in all of his glory and his majesty Surrounding the throne are the 24 elders and the four living beings. They're covered with eyes, always awake, always alert. And night and day they're praising him. And the summary of their praising is that God is holy. For each of his four el winged, uh, his creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. And under his wings, even under the wings, and day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now the scriptures tell us that God is love. We know that. We know that God is faithful. That's pretty important. We know that God is merciful and we want to cling to that one pretty tight. But in no place is that virtue repeated as it is like here with holy. No place to say that God is love, love, love. No place to say God is eternal, God is eternal, eternal. But his holiness is so consequential and so significant that it's repeated and to the Hebrew mind, holy, holy, holy is like saying holy, holier, and holiest. It is, God's holiness is spoken of in terms of the superlative. The one thing that separates man from God is God's holiness. The one thing that separates the God of the Bible from the man-made gods is holiness. When God, man creates God, he creates him in his own fallen image. In the song of God's servant David, and of the, I mean Moses and the Lamb, great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, the King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. God's character. God's holiness is the standard that we're to live up to. That's a pretty high bar. We're thankful for his forgiveness because often we don't get close. But someone has said that the character of God or the holiness of God is the standard for the universe, and I believe that's right. God deserves our worship, not only for who he is, but for what he's done. And I have two broad categories for that. One of all, first of all, is creation. He says, uh, whenever the living creatures gave glory, give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the four, our 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns down and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. I think the one area we can easily identify with is creation. God 
made us. And he said in a loud voice, Fear him and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who has made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and the springs of the water. So God deserves our worship because of his power and his wisdom. He created the universe we live in. A universe that astronomers say, they estimate there's more than 100 billion galaxies. I don't know about you, but that just kind of blows my mind. I just can't fathom that. There was a time that man laid out there and counted the stars. You know, they figured there's two or 3,000 stars. And now we realize there's no way we could even begin to estimate how many stars are out there. God's greatness. And by his power, but all, uh, all the power contained in the entire universe is a small comparison to God's unlimited power. The combined energy of earth storms and the winds and the ocean waves and the other forces of nature do not equal a fraction of God's almighty power. God's power is inherent in his nature. All power is his and under his will. It will be his for all eternity. And any power that we have is given to us by God. And I think sometimes we're surprised when we lose that power, which can happen pretty easily. Because God is all-powerful, he has the ability and strength to do whatever he pleases. His power is not restrained or inhibited by any of his created beings. The other aspect of God, what he has done is redemption. Recreation. He created us, then he recreated us. He, he made us. He bought us back. He redeemed us. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And because you're, with your blood you purchased for God Persons from every tribe, language, and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousands times ten thousands. In other words, a number you can't even count, just beyond our imagination. And they circled the throne of the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And may I ask, if he is worthy of it, who should be giving it to him? And that is us. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all them that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb will be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And they cried in loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And they, all the angels standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell down and worshipped on their faces before the throne, worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Which brings us back to where we started. We began with God's holiness. We end with redemption of God making us holy. Now sociologists tell us that man makes gods in their own image. In other words, we make gods look and act like ourselves. You go back and look at the ancients and the gods they had. They were violent, they were immoral, they were inconsistent. They could offer nothing to man because they were like mankind. That's why paganism and humanism and atheism are bankrupt because they have really nothing to offer. They have man at the center of their religion and their philosophy and they have no hope of making us better. But the Lord God Almighty has something to offer. Instead of us creating him in our image, he created us in his image. I would say he created us in his image. That means he gave us a spirit. We're an eternal being. Our spirits do not die. But God is also in the process, process of recreating his people through the blood of the Lamb. Through the blood of the Lamb, we have been washed. Through the blood of the Lamb, we are made whole. Through the blood of the Lamb, we overcome. Remember Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6? He has this vision of God in the temple, high and lifted up. And what's his first response? His first response is, I'm a sinner. I, I, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And it says the angel took tongs and took a coal from the altar and touched his lips. In other words, cleansing him. It's only after he's cleansed he can say to God, Here am I, send me. See, I can't help but think that 
one of the reasons we need to worship God is because the more we come to know God, the more we realize how much we need him. The more we see God in all of his holiness, the more we see ourselves in our sinfulness. And we see how he can change us, how he can transform us in the image of his son. I read just the other day. It says, don't let what's wrong with you keeping you from worshiping what's right with God. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. When we get to heaven, we're not going to strut around and say, God, how fortunate you are to have me. No, we're not going to say, God, I really deserve this. But rather than we get to heaven, we're going to be overcome with his power and his glory and his holiness. And we're going to throw ourselves down before his feet and worship him. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. And it's there I hope to see, I will see my Savior's face. It's there we will sing, holy, holy, holy. We'll bow before the Lamb and we'll thank him for dying for us. And we will say, Jesus, I just want to thank you. Let's stand and just sing praises to God and worship him who loved us and created us. the time to worship oh come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship oh come just as you are before your One day every knee will bow Still the greatest treasure remains For those who gladly choose you As we, uh, as we sing this next song called Revelation Song, <clears throat> there's going to be a couple of quiet moments in this song as we sing through it. And God commands us at times that we need to be silent to be able to hear him. And so there's going to be a couple of quiet moments in this song, but um, they're still very worshipful moments and moments to truly praise our God. Now worthy is the Lamb who was slain Holy, holy is He Sing a 
new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come.
in forest glades the wonder and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees when i look down from lofty mountain grandeur and see the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou That God his Son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in That on the cross my burden gladly bearing He bled and died to take away my sin Then sings my soul, my Savior God to how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and what joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And then proclaim My God, how great Thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to Thee How great Thou art my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Dear God, as we come to you, as we worship you this morning, as we sing songs of praise unto you, we hope that today has been pleasing unto you. As we, as we perform for you an audience of one, we hope that these songs have, have blessed your name. And we hope that we have been, as followers of you, uplifted by these songs and by this message this morning. To remember how important it is to worship you and praise you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated at this time.
That was great music, guys. Thank you very much. My communion meditation this morning kind of goes along with all this. I wanted to illustrate maybe how much or how little time we actually spend with Jesus in a week. I really wanted a, one of Joe's lariats. And I went and I thought I got an old one out of the barn, brought it in to him, and I said, hey, is this an old one? Can I use it? And he said, yeah. I said, can I cut it up? It's not that old, he told me. <laughs> so good old farm gal, the best thing she goes to is find some baling twine. So I went out and got some, and I tied it together. This string is actually exactly 100 68 inches long. And you think, what's so important about that? Well, there's 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. Therefore, there's 168 day hours in a day. So this string represents one week in our life. Now, over there in the beginning of the week, would you show the red keychain on there? Just kind of hold it up. That is exactly one inch wide. That is the inch or the hour we spend in church on Sunday. And we're thinking, okay, we're doing really good. We're all at church, right? Well, look how long that blue string is. We have the rest of the week to do something about. So my twine representing the week in our life, the red keychain, the hour we spend in church. So I'm thinking, okay, what are we doing with the rest of our week? Well, if we're lucky, we can sleep eight hours a night. Seven nights a week makes 56 hours. That takes us down to 116 hours we have left. Some of us are working, let's just say 40 hours a week. Take that off. We have still 76 hours left. That's a long time that we could be talking to, worshiping, or praying to God. And the old saying is, I'm just so busy, I never have time. So we have to make time. I want to challenge all of us to find more time this week and every week. And help each other discover how you spend your time talking to God. When you find that time. I know one of the easiest things for me to do is when I'm driving. I don't have the radio on, and I really don't like talking on the telephone while I'm driving. So it's a great time to talk to God. When I'm doing dishes, no one else is around, you usually do them by yourself. It's a great time to talk to God. Watering your yard, your flowers is a great time. Running the vacuum, doing chores, walking, riding your bike. If you're a runner and you're out there running, it's a great time to talk to God. So I'm sure all of us could find more time because that little red keychain is less than 1% of our week if all we talk about with God is at church. We need to increase that. So, I don't have all the answers. I know myself, I can do a better job of giving my time to God and encourage others to do as well. So remember, how long this simple piece of blue twine is compared to that little red keychain. And let's make it more of our life than just one inch. Let us pray. Dear God, we are so thankful we are able to be here today to worship you. Please protect us from the evil things in this world and give us the courage and wisdom to always be a good Christian. I pray that all of us find more time to spend with you this week and every week. And in your holy name we pray. Amen.
forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned, I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. You were condemned I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because 